Afternoon, everyone. This is Laura Brooks. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is our second in a series of um, a few uh, finance and operational webinars that we are doing with Stroudwater. Um, and in particular, Jonathan will be our presenter. Um, one thing to note, this is our first around um, RHCs that we'll be presenting. And this is an area where we wanted to start working for quite some time, we just really didn't know where to get started. And so on the flip side, we kind of have some other things to mix um, with John Stroudwater and Greg Wolf, um, building out and doing more with RHCs. So that's going to be some exciting projects that we'll be working on. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please let us know. And thank you all for um, calling in today. Thanks, Laura. So as Laura had mentioned, we will also be recording this presentation and we'll be making that available. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, as we talk through the different topics today, um, rural health clinics is definitely an opportunity that different organizations can look to leverage as we move forward. I would say that rural health clinics is probably one of the most misunderstood programs across the country from both a designation perspective, but also how we can leverage that program to increase and expand access to care. Now, there are some organizations throughout Oklahoma that have continued to leverage the rural health clinic program and across the country, but what we see is this predominantly presents an opportunity for organizations to continue to leverage this program as we look forward. I think uh, two annual meetings ago, I had actually come out and presented uh, in the state of Oklahoma at the annual conference around different ways to leverage the rural health clinic program across the board. What we're gonna really look at today is from a specialty integration perspective. Now, as we continue to move through things today, I'm gonna to talk at a high level about some of the different designation types and some of the different opportunities and looking at those as a means to drive overall financial performance. Then what we'll do is we'll get a little bit more in depth around a strategic approach around how to leverage those rural health clinics to expand specialty providers. Now, I think when we look at the rural health clinic program and we look at whether we're hospitals or independent clinics, the ability to integrate and expand specialty services to rural communities continues to present an opportunity for most organizations. I don't think there's any organization, especially in rural or community-sized hospitals, that have a, an abundance of, of specialty providers. Oftentimes, what ends up happening is, is that specialty providers maybe come to a community for a couple days a month, or what we predominantly see is that our patients are having to travel to larger urban areas to get specialty-type services. And when we look at it from that perspective, what's driving it from this perspective is the fact that specialty providers come with a significant amount of cost. Um, so what ends up happening is, is because those providers come with an amount of cost, and oftentimes our rural communities do not have enough of a certain service type, those providers will end up being at a regionalized area. And in order to help offset the cost associated with those specialty providers, we tend to have a lot of our patients travel to those larger uh, tertiary locations. Again, because there often doesn't warrant the ability to have a provider go out to those specialty services in those rural communities. So what is really driving this? I don't think, again, and I'll talk about this often, is I don't think there's anybody that is saying that the reimbursements they get in a fee-for-service environment are increasing at a greater rate than the actual expenses are going up. So oftentimes what ends up happening is, is that organizations have to continue to subsidize the cost of care through other higher margin type services. So whether we're looking at primary care or specialty services within a clinic, often these surgical services or the inpatient services or those other type of specialty type services are having to cover the costs associated with all of the clinics and those office visits type services. Now, when we look at our specialty providers, whether it's orthopedics or general surgery or dermatology or podiatry, when we look at a lot of those specialty type services, there's no amount of office visits that a provider could do that could end up um, substantiating or covering the cost associated with um, that specialty provider. 
So what ends up happening is, is that we hope that the surgical services that they provide, the back surgeries, the, the orthopedic surgeries, and all of those other things that yield a higher fee service type reimbursement will help subsidize the cost of when they're actually working in those clinics. Now, when we look across the different designation types, there's really four major designation types. We have federally qualified healthcare centers, provider-based clinics, and what a provider-based clinic is, is it's a clinic that operates as a department or a component of a hospital. A rural health clinic, and that rural health clinic can also include our provider-based rural health clinics. And then last is our freestanding health clinics. Now, when we think of our freestanding health clinics, those are the ones that only get a professional fee reimbursement. They don't qualify for really any of those other um, reimbursement advantages. Now, when we look at going across our clinic designation types, we ask ourselves, what is really driving the further transition towards rural health clinics? And I'll use an example of New York. If we go back a couple of years, the state of New York used to have three or four rural health clinics across the entire state. What ended up happening is, is that in 2015, Medicare came out with the Bipartisan Budget Act. And what the Bipartisan Budget Act did is it eliminated the ability to establish off-campus provider-based clinics that would then still qualify for that APC payment. So those practices could continue to get the fee schedule reimbursement. However, they would not get that APC reimbursement. Now, in that 2015 rule, it ended up creating three examples or three options for how practices can continue to get that APC payment. Um, one was by an off-campus dedicated emergency department. The next was an off-campus provider-based department that was billing for services prior to November 2nd of 2015. Or the third was if you were actually considered on campus. Now, what happened is, is in 2019, CMS came out and they actually stated, we are going to eliminate the, the grandfathering in of the off-campus provider-based departments. So what they said is that we no longer care that you are off campus and grandfathered in. We are not going to reimburse you at a greater rate than what those other freestanding practices were getting for being off campus just because you are affiliated or associated with a hospital. And the goal was to actually reduce the OPPS reimbursement, that APC reimbursement, by 60% over a two-year period. Now, what happened is, is a number of hospitals ended up suing. There was a stay of that order. However, CMS continued to say that they are going to continue to reimburse the hospitals at that reduced rate. And what they did is they ended up trending that in at 30% in 2019 and 30% again in 2020. So what ended up happening is, is because a number of these organizations were going to realize significant losses in reimbursement due to the cutting of the APC payment, it started to drive a further push towards leveraging both rural health clinics and critical access hospital designations as a means to help improve reimbursements for those practices. So what it did is it directly went against the prior alignment methodologies where most of the practices would be aligned under a larger physician group associated with a large hospital or in your system. Or you would actually have visiting providers that would continue to bill under the hospital instead of reassigning rights to the hospital community in which it operated. What it did is that by passing this on and chopping those APC payments, it forced our systems to start looking at other ways to recoup those losses that are either sustained through providing primary care or specialty services, or actually further compounding that through the cut of the APC payment. This is what has really driven um, the expansion towards looking at alternative designations. As I mentioned, New York a couple of moments ago that used to have three or four rural health clinics a couple of years ago. When we most recently looked, I believe they're up to almost 30 clinics with, I believe, another 20 that are going to happen over the next year. So definitely a broader push towards leveraging this program as a means to increase reimbursement.
Now, when we look at the different designation types, and I'm going to go through this very quickly so that we can get into the specialty integration component. When we look at the different designation types, again, the first one, the federally qualified health center, a provider-based clinic. Now, because most of the hospitals on here, I believe all of them are critical access hospitals um, or associated or directly involved with the critical access hospital, we're looking at from that perspective of a provider-based clinic, a provider-based rural health clinic, and a freestanding health clinic. Now, when we look at the different reimbursement advantages or the different revenue opportunities, each of these different designation types has specific advantages from a reimbursement perspective. Um, and I'll go through each of these going forward. The first is a 330 grant. Now, the 330 grant is something only applicable and eligible to the FQHCs. No other hospital or clinic type can actually get access to the 330 grant. And the purpose of the 330 grant is to actually cover um, services or cover the cost of care because FQHCs are targeting or prioritizing patients that are from disparate populations, either medically underserved areas or medically underserved populations. So because that program is specifically serving patients from those areas, they're able to pursue a grant to help cover or subsidize the cost of providing care to a specific patient population. As we look across again, the only one that is green is the FQHCs. All of the others are red. The next is the 340B program. And when we talk for the perspective of today, we're really looking at the 340B contract to retail pharmacy program. Now, the contract to retail pharmacy program is where you operate a provider-based either clinic or rural health clinic aligned under your hospital, and you qualify for the 340B program. So what you will do is you will execute a contract with a retail pharmacy where by the patients actually filling their prescriptions at those retail pharmacies, you're able to get the 340B benefit associated with the scripts that are filled with those retail pharmacies where you have that contract relationship with. Now, the FQHCs automatically qualify for the 340B program, and critical access hospitals automatically qualify for the 340B program. So again, any clinic that is aligned under a critical access hospital that's provider-based, including provider-based rural health clinics, automatically qualifies for the 340B program. Now, there does have to take into account the fact that CAUs are not eligible for orphan drugs, um, but that's an entirely different uh, topic. But again, at a grander level, they do qualify for the 340B program. Now, when we look at the next one, the provider-based rural health clinics, the reason I did fewer than 50 beds is because if you are aligned under a hospital of fewer than 50 beds, which does, in fact, include a critical access hospital, then you get the uncapped cost-based reimbursement rate. So that's why I use the fewer than 50 beds instead of just critical access hospitals. Now, the critical access hospital, RHC, does qualify for 340B. If you are aligned under a hospital that has fewer than 50 beds but is not a critical access hospital, then it comes down to the actual dish percentage of that hospital, which dictates whether or not you qualify for the 340B program. If you are a sole community hospital, then that dish percentage is 8%. If you are not a sole community hospital, then that dish is actually 11.75%. And the dish is your disproportionate share hospital. It looks at the proportion of patients that are served that are Medicare and Medicaid. And the last is the FSHC, which does not qualify for 340B under any circumstances. The next is the uncapped technical charge. Now, when we say an uncapped technical charge, what we're referring to is any technical reimbursement that is greater from the APC payment. So because FQHCs do not get a technical reimbursement, uh, that does not apply. Now, our critical access hospitals that operate provider-based clinics, because the facility component in a provider-based clinic is cost-based, the cost-based component of that is uncapped. So if the facility component under a CA is $200 a visit, then you would get $200 a visit from that perspective. If it's $80, you would get $80. Now, I realize it's based on the revenue of cost to charges, 
So for the purposes of conversation, I was just relating it back to a visit. For the rural health clinic program, if it's aligned under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds, you get uncapped cost-based reimbursement. I have seen rural health clinic rates averaging anywhere from 125 up to $400 a visit on averages if they have looked at actually leveraging appropriately building out and leveraging the, uh, the specialty integration for those services. And again, the FSHC gets no benefit at all. Next is method two. Now what method two billing is, is this is something available to all critical access hospitals. And what method two is, it's available to critical access hospitals where you can make an election to actually consolidate the professional and the technical charge to Medicare on a single UB claim. And by doing so, Medicare will give you a 15% increase on the fee schedule reimbursements by electing and consolidating that claim and submitting it to them. So the provider-based clinic uh, is eligible for that. In addition to that, you can also look at other services for method two also, your emergency department providers. Um, looking at it from that perspective, radiology from that perspective. So again, any service on an outpatient perspective where you're providing both a facility and a professional service, if those providers reassign their billing rights to your hospital, you can pursue method two billing. It is not eligible for the rural health clinic program or the FSHC also. Now, the reason why it's not eligible for the provider-based rural health clinic program under a critical access hospital is because when you align it under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds, you get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement rate. So you're not actually billing separately for the professional services or the technical services. You're submitting a single claim that includes the cost associated both with the facility side and the professional side. Now, when we look at tort reform, um, again, this is only eligible to our FQHCs. Because there is limited exposure to FQHCs from a liability perspective, uh, tying back to malpractice, those FQHCs are able to secure reduced um, malpractice insurance costs. So again, they're able to assume lower costs for those services through that tort reform not eligible to any other practice designation type. The last is enhanced PPS reimbursement. Now, when we say enhanced PPS reimbursement, again, we mean any reimbursement that may be greater than what the fee schedule reimbursement is. Because the FQHCs get a geographically adjusted all-inclusive rate for the services they provide, and right now I believe on an average it's around $165 to $167, because that rate is greater than what the actual fee schedule reimbursement is, we consider that enhanced PPS reimbursement. For your provider-based clinics under your critical access hospital, only if you elect method two billing um, do you actually get enhanced PPS reimbursement? Now, I do realize there's other programs available. If you're in a health professional shortage area, you can get the 10% on top of the fee schedule and things with regard to that. But for the purposes of this, we're looking at from a method two. The next is your rural health clinic. Now, again, when aligned under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds, you get an enhanced PPS reimbursement because the average reimbursement is often significantly higher than what you would get if you were billing only fee-for-service revenue. Now, when we look across a number of practices, we generally see a freestanding clinic averaging anywhere from $75 to $85 in fee schedule revenue for a primary care practice. In a provider-based rural health clinic environment, we generally see those rates go from $175 to $225 for a primary care practice. Now, when we actually look at integrating specialty providers, we can see that rate significantly go up from that perspective. And again, it all depends upon the number of providers and the type of providers and the cost associated with those providers that will ultimately dictate that cost-based rate. 
Now, as I've often asked many people across the board, if we were to look at the four designation types across the board, and I were to ask, which of those four do we think can actually yield the highest net financial benefit? Most people often say it's either the FQHC or the provider-based rural health clinic. Um, it's never the FSHC. Um, if you can be anything else besides an FSHC, we generally want to evaluate that because of the disadvantages associated to the FSHC from a reimbursement perspective. Now, when we look at the one that can yield the highest return, it's actually the provider-based clinic aligned under a critical access hospital. And the reason for that is when you're a provider-based clinic aligned under a critical access hospital, the technical side is cost-based. The professional side is limited to the ability of that provider to see as many patients as possible. So if you go back to the old days when providers were seeing 30 plus patients a day in a primary care practice, the amount of revenue that you could generate from a doctor seeing 30 plus 99213s, fours, and fives a day would more than cover or offset the cost associated with that provider. So they were able to generate enough professional revenue to cover the direct cost associated with that physician or APP. In the current environment, because of all the things associated with EHRs and additional documentation and things tied to productivity and performance, our providers are often not able to see those number of patients anymore. So because of the additional administrative burden, the provider-based rural health clinic in today's times are actually seeing a greater net financial benefit for systems than any of the designation types, including critical access hospitals or four critical access hospitals. And the reason for that is because when we're calculating that cost-based rate for a rural health clinic aligned under a critical access hospital, we leave the physician and the APP cost in when calculating that cost-based rate. So at a very high level, we take the fully allocated cost of that clinic and divide by the total number of qualifying visits, and that now is the reimbursement rate that we get for Medicare and in some states Medicaid for the services we provide. Now, they have put certain limitations or barriers in place to ensure that the services that we're providing actually um, meet minimum productivity thresholds. So from that perspective, a single physician, one FTE needs to see 4,200 patients a day, and a single APP working one FTE needs to see 2,100 patients a day. And if we were to do the math, it roughly comes out to 16 patients for a physician and eight patients per day for an APP. So again, these are not the top you know, 75% of performing providers to achieve those thresholds. Now, when we look at the system's approach to optimization, there's really four main strategies for how we can look at optimizing revenue tied to these different designation types. The first one is to really look at converting eligible practices within a health system or at a hospital to a designation that provides the most advantageous reimbursement opportunity. So what that really means is that maybe we have a bunch of freestanding clinics and it would actually be better to make them provider-based clinics or provider-based rural health clinics. What it's saying is, is don't assume that the designation we have now will continue to be the most advantageous designation going forward. We need to continue to look at alternative designation types to ensure that that designation type yields the highest return for the practice in which we're operating. The next is really looking at those that are involved in system relationships. And what it's saying is, is to realign practices throughout a system by leveraging this different designation opportunities to ensure that where those practices are aligned, again, yields the highest return. I've done a number of these assessments across the country where larger systems will, again, continue to operate those practices under a physician group where they're only getting the fee schedule reimbursement. And if they were to align those practices throughout the system under the different rural hospitals, whether they're critical access hospitals or sole community hospitals, and leverage these alternative designation types, 
I've seen net benefits range well in excess of $10 million on an annualized basis per year for systems that have actually looked at realigning these practices and redesignating them throughout the system. So again, don't assume that the prior methodology is always correct. What we're going to talk about a little bit today is really the integration of specialty practices when possible within rural health clinics to leverage that cost-based reimbursement. Now, from a rural health clinic perspective, so long as 51% of the services that that rural health clinic provides are primary care, you can really integrate any other specialty provider, whether it's podiatry, dermatology, orthopedics, general surgery, um, any of those additional surgical and medical specialties into that rural health clinic and have that provider's cost go into that cost-based rate. Now, the reason why this is beneficial is when we think from a cost perspective, we're paying our primary care physicians, say, $200,000 a year. Many hospitals and systems pay general surgeons and orthopedic surgeons and cardiologists five, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 a year plus for the services that they provide. So if we're able to integrate some of those specialty providers into a rural health clinic, even if it's only one or two days a week, the amount of cost that we're associating with that rural health clinic can significantly improve reimbursements from that perspective. Now, again, I'm not suggesting by any means that we align purely from the reimbursement gains. What I'm saying is, is that due to the reimbursement advantages associated from those programs, we can start to evaluate how we can actually further deploy specialty providers out to rural and community-sized areas so that we can start to directly serve patients within the areas that they reside. Again, instead of forcing all those patients to drive to larger communities. And again, by doing this, it allows us to recover the cost associated with those providers going to those rural communities. Um, many of our hospitals, if we do already operate um, specialty practices within rural communities, let's look at ways that we could potentially integrate those specialty practices into those rural health clinics to yield those reimbursement advantages. The fourth of the option is, is to really look at the potential acquisition of practices um, and then leverage those alternative designations to improve reimbursements. So because independent practices can't pursue things such as 340B or get the APC payment or the cost-based reimbursement rate under a critical access hospital or the cost-based rate for a provider-based rural health clinic, it allows us to look at integrating specialty and independent primary care practices, one, to improve the overall continuity and access to care, but two, to also continue to leverage those reimbursement advantages associated with those rural designation types. Next, what we're going to talk about is at a very quick level so we can get in some of the different information is some of the different requirements around establishing those rural health clinics. Now, one of the primary requirements is, is that a rural health clinic, when you're going through the designation process, has to be located in a rural area. And really, from a rural perspective, it's any area that does not include 50,000 or more people in a contiguous uh, in a single census tract or contiguous census tracts that make up that 50,000 or more. So when we look across Oklahoma, there are only three urban areas across the entire state of Oklahoma. Um, any other area that is outside one of these blue areas on this picture is considered rural from the perspective of the rural health clinic program. Now, one thing that I would also like to emphasize is as we're looking at certain areas for potential rural health clinics, you'll notice that a lot of these blue areas are jagged. And you can see that it kind of disappears uh, south of Oklahoma City, and then again, it picks up a little bit. It's important that as you're looking for clinic potential in these outlying communities, that you really get very granular in looking at the placement of those clinics. I have actually seen it get to the point where having a clinic on one side of the road versus the other meant the difference between that practice being in a rural area versus an urban area. 
So again, don't assume just because you're in, say, surrounding Oklahoma City area that it may not qualify. Again, you want to get very granular to ensure that that practice location is, in fact, not in an urban area. The next is really the health professional shortage areas. And again, when we look across the state of Oklahoma, we can see that there are only really three main areas that are considered non-health professional shortage areas. Now, what this means is if we were to actually overlay the two maps on top of each other, we could really establish rural health clinics anywhere throughout the state of Oklahoma, except for those three main areas from an urban area, non-HIPSA area perspective. And really it's up in the Tulsa area, Oklahoma City, and then south along the uh, Texas border from that perspective. So again, as from a strategic perspective, we want to continue to evaluate opportunities to expand services and pursue those alternative designation types. The next area is a medically underserved area. Now, organizations can still use the medically underserved area to pursue certain designation types. And if we look across the country, we can see that there's tons of medically underserved areas across the country. The problem with the medically underserved areas is many of them have not been updated since 1978. And for the purposes of these different designation types, the urban area is done every 10 years and it's tied to the census. The HIPSA or the medically underserved area has to be current within the last four years. So what that means is that if you have a HIPSA or a medically underserved area that was done in 2010, that would not be current enough to meet that rural health clinic program. The state would have to actually update that designation type from a shortage perspective so that you can actually pursue the rural health clinic program. The last of the three main ones for the rural health clinic program is the governor designated secretary certified shortage areas. Now, Oklahoma does currently have 33 governor designated shortage areas. But again, because they have not been updated since 1993 based on the publicly available information on the HRSA website, we could not actually use those to go in for a rural health clinic designation. We would have to actually update those to pursue that program. But what it does is it shows that across the board, when we look at Oklahoma as a whole, there is a number of opportunities that we can look at as a means to pursue the rural health clinic program and potentially the specialty integration aspect of that program. Now, when we look at specialty integration, again, so long as 51% of the services are primary care, we can integrate specialty services into that rural health clinic that becomes a component of that RHC. Now, one thing that I actually want to highlight is that in 2016, CMS changed the requirements regarding uh, the four walls test for your rural health clinics when they operate in a medical office building. So what I mean by that is prior to 2016, a rural health clinic used to make up contiguous space um, so if you had multiple suites within a medical office building, all of those suites had to be contiguous. In 2016, they changed the rules to say you could actually have non-contiguous suites within a medical office building that can make up a single rural health clinic. So what that means is that you could actually have a medical office building with primary care maybe on the main floor in suite 100, and on the third floor you have orthopedic surgery, and on the second floor, you have dermatology, and those suites are three of maybe the 10 you have in that building, you can actually group those together into a single RHC. Now, again, you have to meet certain requirements from a public awareness perspective, but as long as you meet those requirements, again, you can look to integrate specialty practices into an RHC, even if it's not within the four walls of that original primary care RHC from that perspective. So next we're gonna talk about is a case study. And what we looked at was, is we did a case study for a critical access hospital. This practice or this critical access hospital was currently operating 
three rural health clinics as provider-based rural health clinics under the critical access hospital. In addition to that, they were also operating a provider-based specialty practice. And the specialty practice was one where they were billing the facility side getting cost-based as a critical access, and they were then billing out the professional CPs as a provider-based clinic. The one that we looked at first was general surgery. So again, they had that provider-based general surgeon, and they were also operating that rural health clinic. So when we looked at the RHC designation requirements, that surgical practice did not have an employed APP within that surgical practice. So as a standalone, it would not have met the RHC requirements. Next, we also looked at a primary care requirement. Again, because it was general surgery, it did not meet the RHC requirements of being 51% primary care. So that clinic could not operate as a standalone rural health clinic. We would have to look at actually evaluating the integration of that practice into one of the other rural health clinics. Now, because that practice was actually located um, right next to one of the oral health clinics that was already established, we could easily integrate that specialty practice, that general surgeon, into that rural health clinic. Now, what we first looked at was the specialty as a provider-based clinic. And we could see where they were roughly getting $157 per visit from Medicaid and Medicare as a provider-based clinic. If we were to integrate that specialty provider, that general surgeon, into that provider-based rural health clinic, the average reimbursement rate for Medicare and Medicaid would have gone up to roughly $175. So they would have actually gained across all of their rural health clinics almost $20 a visit. From a reimbursement perspective, that would have actually increased their reimbursements by $320,000. Now, when we look at the top impact, there was a minor top impact. And the reason for that is because, again, when we integrate the specialty providers into that rural health clinic, we're keeping the cost associated with that specialty provider in that rural health clinic. So there is a minor dilution of overhead expense that got reallocated to that rural health clinic instead of remaining a part of those other departments. But nonetheless, by integrating that specialty provider, they were able to increase reimbursements by $275,000 a year just by integrating that specialty practice into those rural health clinics. It was already provider-based. They were already billing. They already had rural health clinics. They were already meeting those requirements. But again, all it was doing was changing that designation type to one that yielded a higher reimbursement rate for the system as a whole or the hospital as a whole. The next that we looked at was actually a multi-hospital system. And what this multi-hospital system was is they had four practices that were actually off-campus that would be impacted by site neutrality, and they had a single on-campus practice that wasn't impacted by site neutrality. What they wanted to look at was is changing the designation types of those practices. And what I wanted to do was illustrate this perspective so we can see from a greater than to fewer than 50 beds from a rural health clinic perspective to reflect some of the differences and reimbursements from that. So what we looked at was, is we wanted to look at redesignating those practices as rural health clinics aligned under a hospital, again, with fewer and greater than 50 beds. Now, as a hospital, they were getting an average of $143 for those visits as provider-based clinics under the current designation type. If we were to change those practices to provider-based rural health clinics aligned under a hospital with greater than 50 beds, they would have actually received the capped rural health clinic rate. So their rate across Medicare and Medicaid would have dropped from $143 down to $84.70 in that year. It would have been a $1.6 million loss per year for this system if they had actually converted those to rural health clinics under their current bed type. However, because their average daily census of this hospital was in the 20s, they could have easily dropped the number of beds to fewer than 50. 
So what they could have done is by dropping the beds to fewer than 50 and then converting them to rural health clinics, they would have actually gotten the uncapped cost-based reimbursement rate. And if they had done that, their rate would have gone from $143 up to $183. So they would have gained almost $40 per visit for a net benefit of $1.1 million a year. So again, what this highlights is by changing some of the different designation types and by changing where those practices are aligned and how they're aligned and the bed complement, all of these different nuances have a direct impact on the reimbursements that those practices receive. There is no one size fits all approach to the alignment and designation of practices. We need to continue to evaluate those practices going forward to ensure that that designation type and the alignment of those practices is most advantageous. So what I'm gonna do now is we're right at about quarter of. I'm gonna open it up to see if anybody has questions. Um, we can either submit them in the chat box um, or we can unmute people and they can ask them. Um, if not, then what we will do is we will convert this to an actual video that people can download or watch at a later date. Um, also, if there are questions that may arise at a later date, please feel free to shoot me an email or Laura or anybody else. Um, and, and we'll be sure to respond back about any of those questions you may have. 